Good morning, church. Good morning, good morning. Hey, happy Thanksgiving. Can you believe it? We're at Thanksgiving week. Uh, hey, I want to thank everyone who uh, helped us out, who participated in Thanksgiving Mart. Uh, it's so fun on Sundays like this, being in the lobby, seeing people carrying baskets in and turkeys and, and bringing all this stuff. And after this service, we have a, a team, some of you are probably on it, that will put those together, make them look beautiful, and get them distributed today. And if you don't know, uh, this helps helps us to serve families right here in our neighborhood, most of them through our partnership with uh, Marie Hughes Elementary School right around the corner. Uh, this week, Madison and I had a, a great meeting with the school administration there and their instructional council, and it was so fun to rehearse uh, the stories of uh, our partnership for 11 years now. Y'all, for 11 years, we've been showing up at Marie Hughes and, and partnering with them, and, and I shared a story with them, how the very first time we got a meeting, I met with the counselor. She kind of crossed her arms, leaned back in her chair, and she said, so what do you want for me? And I told the, them this week, I said, I'm going to tell you the same thing I told, the, told her that day. I'm not here to get anything from you. I'm here to ask you, what do you want from me? What do you want from Harvest? And uh, it has been so fun uh, to partner with them. One of the reasons that we were meeting with them uh, this week is that we're working on launching uh, what we hope will be, be the very first chapter in New Mexico uh, of something called LifeWise. Uh, we're hoping to launch that uh, in the next uh, semester. Um, and I'd love for you just to pray with us. Things are going well, um, but we operate on this premise that everything happens in the natural before it, or in the spiritual before it happens in the natural. And so I would love for you to, to pray with me as we're making these final uh, uh, conversations conversations happen to get this launched in the new year. How many of you would pray with me for that so we can just continue? All right. The first service, the entire service is praying. Madison, half the second service is with us, so I'm just messing with y'all. <clears throat> um, so that's happening, and uh, it's really, really exciting. Uh, quick uh, quick Thanksgiving uh, for just a second. I just want to tell you that Lisa and I, uh, we have a lot to be thankful for, and at the very, very top of our list is that we are so thankful for each and every one of you. Uh, this week, we just spent some time talking about how much we love you, how much we love Harvest, how we can't believe that God called us to Albuquerque to be part of this amazing family, and I mean it. I mean it. We just love y'all so, so much. So this Thanksgiving, as you're digging into your Thanksgiving meal, know that your pastors love you dearly. Uh, quick Thanksgiving survey. How many of you will be celebrating Thanksgiving by eating a turkey? Let me see your hands. You all, all the turkey eaters. Okay. How many of you will be celebrating with a ham? Do I have any ham people? Oh, wow. Um, so based on that, two hands in the air if you're doing both. Let me see the bowl. Oh, yeah. All right. Ambitious. I love it. And then how many of you are like, no way. We live in New Mexico. We're going Mexican food. Enchiladas, tamales, anything? All right. We got, we got some there. All right. I thought that, that might happen. It's going to be an incredible, incredible week. And next Sunday, I'm preaching a message on gluttony. So you're going to definitely going to want to be here for that. The altars will be packed. It'll be amazing. I should have used that joke in the first service. That was good. All right. We, uh, we're in a series right now called Hope in the Dark. Today, uh, the message is titled Waiting for Hope in the in the dark, waiting for hope in the dark. Last week, we started by uh, going to a book of the Bible that probably doesn't get a lot of attention. It's a short book, only three chapters. It's the book of Habakkuk, all right? Three chapters. Uh, chapter one, we looked at last week. Habakkuk goes to God for the people, and he, he says, hey, what I see happening around me does not line up with what I know about you. And so he, he's doing what his name means. The name Habakkuk means both to wrestle and to embrace. It means wrestle and embrace. So we see Habakkuk going to God and he's saying, I'm embracing what I know about you, but I'm wrestling with you because there's things that I see in this world that don't seem to line up with what I know about you. And I, I especially can't understand why you're not stepping into my dark season and doing something 
something about this. So that was chapter one. Chapter two, the whole chapter is about waiting. Okay, it's about waiting. In case you missed last week, I'll, I'll just catch you up a little bit. Habakkuk is what's called a minor prophet. He wrote about 600 years before the birth of Jesus. Now, most prophets, if you read through the, the prophets, most prophets, here's how it worked, is that God would speak to the prophet and then the prophet would carry that word to the people of God. That was the job of the prophet. Habakkuk actually does it backwards. He takes uh, uh, the, the word or the complaints uh, of the people and he goes to God on behalf of the people. What we read in Habakkuk is him saying to God what the people uh, are thinking at that moment. So in chapter one, what's happening is that Habakkuk is asking questions. He's expressing frustration uh, and God answers him. And it's pretty exciting. It's encouraging, especially at first, because God says, hey, get ready, Habakkuk. Get ready, uh, my people, because I'm about to answer you and, and I'm going to bless you. In fact, it, I'm going to bless you so much that if I told you what I was going to do, you wouldn't even believe it. But it's really short, that period of excitement, because right after that, he says, I'm going to raise up your enemies, the Babylonians. And that is where the wrestling begins, because Habakkuk's like, I don't understand how you're going to bless us and raise up the enemy. I, it just doesn't make sense. And so he begins to wrestle and embrace. And then we turn to chapter two, where we are today. And Habakkuk is waiting. He's waiting for God's promises to come true. And if you have found yourself in a dark season, that's just a metaphor for a difficult season. Something is happening in your life and it doesn't make sense. It feels like you're stumbling through life in the dark. You need a flashlight. You need a lantern. You need a, you need a light to come on in your life. I have good news for you today. You have come on a great day. I believe that God has a word for you today. So today we're gonna learn about waiting for hope in the dark. And I want to do what we do every single week. I want us to pause and pray and get our hearts ready. We position our hearts to hear from God. I believe every single time that we open God's word that he wants to talk to us. And I've learned that if I will position myself to hear from, get from him, then I tend to get more out of it. And so this has become a habit I, I love to lead you in every week. It takes us about 20 seconds. But would you just pray with me right now and get ready because God is here and he wants to help you to find hope in the dark. So let's pray. Jesus, we are so thankful for you, for your presence, and we're really thankful for your word. Because your word is so important to us, we don't want to miss this moment. So we pause, we push every distraction aside, we get our hearts ready, we lean in to hear from you today. We ask that you would speak to us through your word today. Every single person in this room, we want to hear from you today. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. How many of you absolutely love to wait. Let me see your hands. You love, yeah, that's what I thought. Waiting is not that exciting. Waiting is really, really hard. Uh, our staff went on a little retreat uh, this week. Uh, it was so fun. Uh, we loaded up in the van like a field trip. Uh, we crammed together. My wife was the DJ uh, on our trip. She let everyone do a song request. It became a sing-along, and we were all singing together and driving down the road. We went to Lubbock, and we went to see uh, comedian John Christ. Uh, we ate some fantastic barbecue because we were in Texas. We got up the next day. We, get, we went to a pastry place that my wife had discovered online. And we ate incredible breakfast. We got some coffee. And then we had a little one last surprise before we headed home. We went to Adventureland to race go-karts, all right? It was awesome. I walked up to the counter. I said, hello, uh, my name's Jason. This is my team. We're here to have some fun. We have no children with us. We're all adults, and we're going to play like kids for the next two hours. And she said, you definitely want to go to race go-karts. And so we went to race the go-karts, and two things happened. This will prove uh, our, our, our difficulty with waiting. We got there. There was a bunch of 10 and 12-year-old boys that were in line ahead of us, and they were horrible drivers. And so it was taking forever because they were wrecking into 
of things and they were bumping each other and they couldn't reach the pedals and it was and I'm I'm sitting there just like get these kids out of my go karts I just want to go and to drive and I was being very very impatient so finally they opened the gate Lisa and I were right there and Lisa asks the employee some of you have done this before which cart is the fastest he points her towards the first car in the line and says, that's the fastest. She does not wait, okay? Everyone say, she did not wait. Okay, she did not wait. She took off running because she wanted to beat me to the fastest car. The, 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 the teenager running the go-karts yelled after her, ma'am, you have to scan your bracelet before you get into a car. Do you know what I did? Bam, scan my bracelet. He said, please get in car number one, sir. And I got the fast go-kart. Lisa had to get a slower go-kart, and it was wonderful. And she learned what Habakkuk wants to help us with. She learned the value of waiting. The value of waiting. Isn't that a great story? The value of waiting. Waiting is hard. Three things that Habakkuk helps us with that will, if you're in the dark, if you're in a a, a difficult, maybe a hopeless situation, three things that Habakkuk, especially in chapter two, helps us. How do you wait for the Lord? Number one is this. Number one, listen to God. Here here it is in Habakkuk chapter two, verse one. So remember, context is Habakkuk has gone to God. He said, it just doesn't make sense. I I don't understand. Why aren't you doing anything? Uh, you, You have the power, but you're not moving in my life. And God says, I'm about to, and it's gonna blow your mind but I'm going to raise up the enemy. And then we turn to chapter 2, and here's how it starts. It says, uh, Habakkuk says, I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. So Habakkuk is saying, I'm going to position myself in the best possible location to see what God is going to say. He says, I'm going to station myself at the rampart. How many of you know what a rampart is? Okay, How many of you? You should be embarrassed because you sing this in the Star Spangled Banner. Did you know that? Or is this one of those things you just hum along at the baseball game? <laughs> right? So, so over in the Star Spangled Banner, it says, or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. Here, here now, next time you sing the Star Spangled Banner, or the next time you read Habakkuk chapter 2, you're going to know. You're going to know. Rampart is the defensive wall of a castle or a walled city. They would build a wall around the city, and they would build up the very top a rampart. It was, it was a location for someone to keep watch. It was a high place. It was wide enough for someone to walk so they could walk, and they could check and make sure, is the enemy coming? And they would keep watch over their city from the rampart. And this is what, what Habakkuk says. He says, I'm positioning myself on the high place so I can see and hear God. And notice how he says this. He says, I will look to see what he will say to me. Okay, that Some of you, especially men, this is probably not making sense. You're thinking, uh, look and see has nothing to do with hear and say. Because look and see is eyes, but hear and say is ears. And, and, and some of you, I'm going to help you so much right now. I'm going to help you in all of your life. I'm going to help you in your marriage. I'm going to help you at work. Habakkuk is teaching us uh, something about listening. Okay, he, He's helping us to learn how we really listen. He's helping us with this idea that we have to look to see what someone is saying. He's helping us to see that listening is not just ears, but listening involves the eyes as well. Ask me how I know. Because Lisa's taught me this. Can I tell you how? Lisa will sometimes say, Jason, did you hear what I said? And I will say, yes, I heard what you said. And Lisa will look back at me and she'll say, well, I can't tell because you're not looking at me. And early in my marriage, I would say very naively, I don't need to look at you to hear you. But I learned that that is not true. I learned that if I will look and listen, that I will hear better. 
I look and listen. I can see the body language. I can see the facial expressions. I'm not just hearing the words. I am hearing the entire message. Are you following me, man? It's like when you ask your wife, where do you want to go and eat? And she says, I don't care. Can I tell you something? She does care, all right? You got to look to see, to hear what your spouse means. Habakkuk is helping you in your marriage. He's helping you with your relationship with God. He's saying, I'm gonna look, I'm gonna see, and I'm gonna hear what God is saying. This is, this is the, the, the first part of listening. How, how do we listen in the dark? Because here's the deal. Listening in the dark is even harder. Because almost all the time when we're in the dark, we're frustrated we're upset, we're angry, we're irritated, and the last thing you wanna do in the dark is to listen. What we wanna do in the dark is to tell God all the ways he's messed up and why he's not doing the thing in our life. We really just wanna tell him, we don't wanna listen, and Habakkuk, he positions himself on the rampart, and he says, I'm gonna listen, I'm gonna listen. So I wanna do something really quick. I wanna, I wanna show you five ways that God speaks to his people because this is gonna help you really in any season of your life. How does God talk to us? Number one, five ways. Number one, God talks to us through his word. You need to know this. The number one way that God talks to his people is through his word. The number one way. When you're searching, when you're asking, when you're trying to figure something out, when you're trying to make a decision, when you need wisdom, I'm just trying to encourage you. The number one place you should go is God's word. It is in writing. You don't, you don't have to really guess. He says it right there in black and white. And guess what? It's never changed. It's always the same. It's there for you. The number one way he speaks to us is through his word. And by the way, this one requires us to look and to listen, all right? I would encourage you, just like we did a few moments ago where we prayed and we got our hearts ready for the word, I would encourage you, that's a habit I hope that you'll take not just on Sundays, but back home uh, on Monday and on Tuesday and throughout the week, that if, as you set a few minutes aside to get into God's word, that you would just stop before you open the page and you say, God, will you talk to me today? I'm listening, I'm looking, I'm paying attention. I want you to, to talk to me. Second Timothy chapter three, verse 16 says this. It says, all scripture, so that means the whole Bible, Genesis to Revelation, is God breathed. It's his words, and it's useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness. So the servant of God, that's us, can be thoroughly equipped or built up for every good work. Hebrews chapter four, verse 12 says it this way, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. So God's word is the number one way he speaks to his people. Number two, God speaks to his people through his spirit. When you accept Christ, we, we believe in the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And, and when you accept Christ, you get all three. But then we learn in Acts about a, a separate infilling or baptism or immersion in the Holy Spirit. And, and if you don't know, you're part of a church here or you're sitting in a church here that believes in the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. He's not, not just one of the Godhead. He's the Godhead that was sent by Christ to to help us, to comfort us, to equip us, to live inside of us, to help us to live in this crazy world. And if we'll pay attention, the Holy Spirit will help you. He'll talk to you. He'll, he'll nudge you. He'll, he'll say, hey, 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 you shouldn't go there. You shouldn't say that. Hey, you should go there. You should say that. Hey, have you talked to this person? Hey, when's the last time? He'll, he'll help you. We see this a lot in the New Testament especially in the book of Acts. Acts is all about um, the, the Holy Spirit and his activity in the early church. Acts chapter 13, verse two, it says this, while they are worshiping the Lord and fasting, watch, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I've called them to do. In other words, they would have missed the instruction of God had they not been tuned in to the Spirit of God. John 16, verse 13 says, but when he, the spirit of truth, that's the Holy Spirit, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet 
to come. This week I was in some meetings and uh, some other pastors. We took a few minutes before we got into the meeting to just pray and, and, and we were praying for one another. I was praying for a friend of mine that was there. While we were praying, I felt like the Holy Spirit uh, put something to my heart to share with my friend. And so later in the day we had a break and we were you know, refreshing coffee and getting ready for the next round of meetings. I just went to him. I said, hey, just real quick, this morning when we were praying, I felt like the Holy Spirit wanted me to share something with you and I shared it with him and he you know, you know that moment like kind of the eyes got big and, and I could tell like it was it was hitting it, it made sense he goes I needed that I've been praying about a situation at the church and some of the words that I use to God are the same words you just used to convey that to me that was the Holy Spirit speaking through you that's exactly what I needed one of the ways God speaks to his people is through the Spirit of God, but number three, and this ties with the story I just told you, he speaks to his people through other people, through other people. Now, I do need to warn you, okay? Everyone you know has opinions, and everyone you know that has an opinion would love to share their opinion with you, okay? How many of you know someone with a stupid opinion? Raise your hand, okay? Now, now don't tell me if you're married to them or anything like that. Just, we all know people with dumb opinions. What I'm not saying is this. Don't listen to everybody. I'm not saying give everyone the right to speak into your life. I'm telling you this. God speaks to you through other people, so you better choose your friends wisely. Because God will use your friends to help you to correct you, to challenge you, to hold you accountable, to ask you questions. Men, I know it was announced earlier, this is one of the big reasons we started Men's Alliance. Because men are really bad at this part. Women are much better at us at finding friends, at doing life together, at giving each other permission to speak into each other's lives. But men, you think you're big and tough and strong and you don't need anybody. And so we, we keep people out of our lives and I'm just telling you, that is an awful way to live. So we're changing the culture. We're saying men or women, we don't live in isolation. We don't live alone. We don't make decisions alone. We need other people to help us, to encourage us. And God actually showed us in Acts chapter 2 that he was going to use other people to speak to us. He says in Acts 2, it says, in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit on all people. And one of the things he says is, your sons and your daughters will prophesy. And at the end of this uh, passage, verse 18, he says, I'll pour out my spirit and they will prophesy. And one of the things that happens with prophecy, that, in, that, that involves you hearing from God and then using your mouth to deliver that message to another person or group of people. In other words, you need some friends that will hear from God on your behalf. Now, let me say this. You need to hear from God for yourself, but you need some friends that will help you to hear from God, that will encourage that, that will bring confirmation. So you gotta be careful who you're listening to. James chapter three says it this way, wisdom that comes from heaven is pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, and good fruit, impartial and sincere. So that's one way to judge the friends and the advice that they're sharing with you. It should match that, James three. Proverbs 12 verse 15 says, the way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. You need some friends that you can bounce ideas off of, that you can share with. How does God talk to his people? Number four, he talks to us through nature. Romans chapter one, verse 20. For since the, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his power, his nature, they've been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that the people are out without excuse. In other words, God reveals his invisible qualities through things that we can see. So this happens when, when you see a beautiful sunrise, it takes your breath away, like it's meant to stop you, to cause a pause, and you look at that and you say, only God can do that. Only God, wow. And you pause, and you, you have a moment. This is meant when, when there's a storm moving across the city, and you're in a place where you can see it coming, and it's meant to pause, and so, man, my God is powerful. 
He is strong. He is mighty. This happens when you see a butterfly kind of float down out of the sky and land on a flower. And you, you, you realize the delicacy, the, the intimacy, how God created the world. And he paid attention to every single detail. This happens in, in these moments. And I'll tell you where it really happens is it happens when the Holy Spirit reveals himself through a really, really good brisket. <laughs> now I'm preaching. How does, God, how does God speak to us? Number five, through circumstances. This is number five for a reason. I don't think it should be number one. I think it should be number five. God will sometimes, often use circumstances to guide us, to speak to us, to challenge us. We see it in, in Jonah's story. We see it in, in Balaam's uh, story in Numbers 22 when, when the donkey is used by God uh, to speak to, to Balaam. That's a weird circumstance. We see it in Exodus where God uh, sends the plagues to get Pharaoh's attention. So sometimes God will use circumstances to speak to us, to shape us, to get, to get our attention. So that's how God speaks to us. So Habakkuk teaches us that in the waiting, we need to listen. We listen to God. Number two, we're taught to write down what God says or to document what God is saying. Here it is in Habakkuk chapter two, now verse two. Then the Lord replied, write down the revelation. Make it plain on tablets so a herald may run with it. I learned a long time ago the value of writing down what God is saying. I'll tell you how I learned as a teenager. Uh, my dad came to me. He said, Jason, uh, get you a notebook, and in every service you're in, Sunday morning, youth group, camp, wherever you are, I want you to take notes. Uh, I want you to write down the, who's preaching and what passage they're preaching out of. I want you to put the date, and I want you to take notes, and I, I want you to write it down. And he said, if you'll do this for a year and you bring the notebook back to me, I'll pay you. And I don't remember how much it was, but he paid me uh, to take notes. He paid my brother to take notes. Now he's doing it with all six of his grandkids. A at a certain age, he pulls them in. He says, hey, if you'll take notes at the end of a year, show me your notebook. I'll give you $100. All of the grandkids have responded the same way. They're like, wow, $100. And I'm watching this transpire because I'm thinking, you have no idea how he's about to change your life because he's teaching you a discipline of writing down what God is saying. So I learned that lesson. I have a shelf full of notebooks. I, this week I went, I started just randomly pulling them off and I could see where God spoke to me in high school and where God spoke to me in, in, in college and where God spoke to me in the last 10 years. And, and, and I, I've just got a habit of writing it down. I have a file on my computer when, when someone has a prophetic word and I believe like, okay, that is for me, that's for us, that's for harvest. I go to that file as quickly as I can. I date it, I write that down, I wanna capture it. I capture it because all of us, our memories are going to fail us. You give a little bit of time, you get a little bit of distance, and we don't remember things quite as clearly, and so we write it down. This year, I started a new discipline that I'm pretty excited about. I started a five-year journal, and, I, and I, I'm really enjoying it because it takes so, I write two or three, maybe four sentences per day, and the idea is that, that year over year, you get to see how those stack one upon the other, and the other day, I wrote something, uh, I wrote something that God had done. And I literally, as I wrote it, I thought, I can't wait to read this in a year. Another time I wrote a question that I'm praying about, and I thought, I can't wait to go back in a year and see what I was wrestling with and see how God answered it. There's a value in writing it down, and God knew this. And so he's telling Habakkuk, he's saying, don't just listen, write down the revelation. He said, write it down. Why? Let me tell you why this is important. John chapter 10, verse 10 I preach this verse often. I usually preach the second half. Let me preach the first half. The first half says this. The thief, that's the enemy. His name is Satan. It says he comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So what you need to know is that your enemy wants to steal from you what God has given you. And this is why we write it down. We write it down so that we do not forget 
so we don't forget. Let me show you. Go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 with Adam and Eve, and the serpent is there, and the serpent uh, is representative of Satan, of the thief that we see in John 10, and it says this. The serpent comes to, to Adam and Eve and says this, says to Eve in, in uh, Genesis 3 verse 1, Watch this question. This is important. Did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Let me tell you why this is important. Satan still uses this tactic today. He loves to come to you after church, after life group, after, after uh, camp, after uh, an encounter with God, and you have something in your heart, and, and you know God has, has talked to you, Satan loves to come and steal from you what God gave to you, and he starts with this question, did God really say that? Did God really say that? And this is why this discipline of writing it down is so important, is that you need the place that you can go back and say, on this date, God said this. This is the verse he gave me. I'm anchoring my belief to his word, which, by the way, I'll just say one more time, is the number one way God speaks to his people, because that will stop the enemy from the ability to steal from you what God has given to you. So I go to the file on my computer, I go to the journal in my, on my bookshelf, I go and I remember what God gave me. Here it is in Psalm 77 verse 11, it says, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. When something amazing happens, when God does something miraculous, we think we're never going to forget. But guess what? All of us forget. All of us, the details get fuzzy. <laughs> with enough time, we, we begin to get overwhelmed with the other parts of life, and we forget. And that's why the psalmist said, I will remember the deeds. If you want to remember what God's done for you, I'm just going to encourage you, write it down. Psalms 103 says this, praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And then he goes through the benefits. He says, he forgives your sins, he heals your disease, he redeems your life in the pit, he crowns you with love and compassion, he satisfies your desires with good things, so your youth is renewed like the eagles. That's a lot of benefits, but when life is dark, when you're in the middle of pain, when, when things are difficult, it's, more, it's hard to remember the good things that God has done, the good things that God has said, because darkness is consuming. It wraps around you. It takes over. So we write it down so that we do not forget. So we listen, we write it down, and then number three, we wait. We wait. What are we waiting for? We are waiting for the faithfulness of God. We're waiting. Some of you today, you're waiting for the faithfulness of God. In recent weeks, your life has blown up. Something has happened. You, you couldn't have imagined that this is what's going to happen, and now you're waiting and it's so hard because it doesn't match the realities of what you know God to be. So we wait. We wait. What are we waiting for? The faithfulness of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9 says it so succinctly. It simply says, God is faithful. God is faithful. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. I love this imagery of this verse. We hold unswervingly. It's like you're driving through a storm. The wind is blowing, the rain is beating, the lightning is flashing. There's so many distractions, but you are focused. You hold on swervingly. I'm gonna continue towards the promises of God because my God is faithful. Waiting is hard. That's why when I asked earlier, how many of you just love to wait? Nobody raised their hand. Waiting is hard, but here's what I also want you to know. Waiting is worth it. It's worth it. Back in chapter 2, verse 3 says, For the revelation awaits an appointed time. He's saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reveal something to you, but it's waiting. I'm waiting for the right time, and I need you to wait for the right time. 
<clears throat> the Hebrew word for appointed time here, it means, it means the right time. <laughs> it means the appointed time, the fixed time, the divinely chosen time. So maybe one of the best ways to think about this is you got to think about a baby being born. A pregnant mother goes to the doctor, and they confirm that, yes, you are having a baby, and they measure, and they look at the calendar, and they do some math, and they say, we predict that your due date is, and they set a date on the calendar. And some of you have already been through this. You never made it to that date. Why? Because God had a different date than your doctor. Some of you got to that date, and the baby didn't come, and you are angry at the world, at your husband especially, and at the doctor. <laughs> Why? And you got out and you, you did all the things they tell you. We, you were walking and you were doing all the things to try to get that baby moving because God had an appointed time. Because God, God determines when things happen. You can't stop him, and I don't even know that you could speed him up. Like, and that's what he's saying. He's saying the revelation is coming at an appointed time. So then it says this. It says, though it linger, watch the instruction, wait for it. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. I, I love this language, though it linger. This word linger uh, in Strong's Concordance, it, it, it uses a few other words to help us to, to know what this means. It means to tarry or to delay. And when I read that, I stopped because I thought of my papa. My papa uh, was a pastor of a little country church in rural Oklahoma. Uh, he, I loved to visit him uh, in the summers. We'd go, we'd go visit. We, he had a little hobby farm. He had a few cows, and we'd help him with his cows. And we'd go catch grasshoppers so that we could catch perch, so that we could catch catfish. It was like a whole scenario. He had to do one to do the other. And I loved visiting him. And he had some funny sayings. How many of y'all know? No, people from Oklahoma have funny sayings. Come on. And, and I would call him and I'd say, I, I, I'd say, Papa, are you going to come to New Mexico this summer and go, are we going to go fishing this summer in New Mexico? And he would say this. I don't know if you've ever heard this phrase. He'd say, he'd say, Jay, I'm coming if the good Lord tarries and the creek don't rise. Have you ever heard that? Do you even know what I'm saying? I didn't know what he was saying. I would say, Papa, we don't have creeks in New Mexico. You have nothing to worry about. <laughs> You're going to make it. He said, if the good Lord waits, if he, if he tarries, right? That's what, that's what Habakkuk, he's saying, he's saying, if the promise of God waits, if it, if it delays, if, it, if, it's, if, it's, if there's a hesitancy, he says, I just want you to wait for it. And here's why, is because I think waiting is worth it. Waiting is worth it. I think you can help me with this. You've heard this saying, you've heard it, so you can help me with it. Um, good things come to those who wait. wait, right? We know this, even though we don't like waiting, we know that good things come to those who wait. Uh, uh, I had some men in the first service, they were able to help me with this one. I bet there's some men in their service that can help me with this one. The only way to smoke a brisket is low and slow. slow because the waiting is worth it. It's worth it. The waiting is worth it. We went to a restaurant earlier and uh, earlier, we went to a restaurant uh, a few weeks ago and we ordered and the waiter said to us, said, you just need to know that everything is made to order. So it takes a little extra time. I mean, you know, the wait is worth it. You can go to a fast food restaurant and you don't have to wait, but you get what you don't wait for, right? Or you can go to a gourmet restaurant and you can wait for it and it is so much better. The waiting is worth it. So he says, though it linger, wait for it. Though it, though it linger, don't give up because the wait's gonna be worth it. And then I wanna go to verse four, but I wanna set it up. Because many theologians uh, believe that verse four is probably the most important verse in the three chapters of Habakkuk. It's like a, it's like a linchpin for the entire book of Habakkuk. So, so the, the setup is this. Habakkuk chapter two has what's called the five woes 
of Babylon, W-O-E, like woe is me, not like woe, slow your horse down, okay? Like woe, woe, oh, this is bad, like, like, like this, this is a bad thing, the five woes, and each time what God's saying to Babylon, he's saying, don't worry, I'm coming for you. Don't worry, you will pay for your sin. But Habakkuk is so confused because right now the Babylonians are thriving and the people of God are in the dark. So there's these five woes. I'll just read them to you quickly. Woe to him who piles up stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion. How, mu- how long must this go? Woe to him who builds his house by unjust gain, setting his nest on high to escape the clutches of ruin. Third woe, woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by injustice. Number four, woe to him who gives drink to his neighbors, pouring it from the wine skim till they're drunk so that he can gaze on their naked bodies. Number five, woe to him who says to wood, come to life, or to life of stone, wake up. Can it give guidance? It is covered with gold and silver. There is no breath in it. So we have these five woes, and Habakkuk, he sees them all, and he's waiting for God to bring justice. And here's what verse four says, linchpin verse of the whole story. See, the enemy is puffed up. His desires are not upright, but the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. You've probably heard this this phrase, this line, the righteous live by faith. In the New Testament, Galatians chapter 3, uh, verse 11, this actually refers back to Habakkuk when it says, clearly no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous live by faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 says, therefore we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. Verse 7, for we live by faith, not by faith sight. This is how men and women of God live. We see things differently. We have the ability to wait because we don't only operate on what we see in the natural, but we see things in the supernatural. I said it earlier when I asked you if you would pray with me for our partnership with Marie Hughes. Everything happens in the spiritual before it happens in the natural. We believe that as men and women of God. We believe that that what we see with our eyes is not the most important thing because sometimes our eyes deceive us. It's kind of funny when we're um, out hunting, we're looking for a particular game animal and it's amazing what your imagination can do because of what you are looking for. All of a sudden, every cactus looks like an antelope. Every sagebrush looks like a mule deer, right? It's like all of a sudden, why? Because it's what you're looking for. Because your eyes will deceive you. So some of us have been living in this darkness and we're letting what we see in the natural deceive us and we're making it too important. And we're saying, I don't know what to do. That's all that's ever gonna happen. The enemy is after me and I have no way out. And yet God is saying, if you will let me, I will open your spiritual eyes to see something different, but it's going to require faith. So faith says, despite what I see, God is good. Faith says, despite what's happening and it feels like the enemy is winning, God is powerful. It it says, faith says, I don't have the answers, but God is all knowing. Faith says, God is trustworthy. Faith says, God knows what's best. Even though I can't make sense of these circumstances, faith says, God must have a bigger picture in mind. God must know things that I don't know. Faith says God knows best. Faith says God is strong. Faith says there's more to meets that than meets the eye. Faith says my story isn't over. Faith says Jesus is over everything. And so because of that, we have the ability to wait. We can wait. We can, we can just settle in and we can hold fast and we can wait. This is what Habakkuk does in chapter two. He waits, he lives by faith, and then after these five woes, we have this verse, verse 20. The Lord in his holy temple, let all the earth be silent before him. 
uh, in the New Living Translation, they add one word to this, and I really like it. They add this word on the front end of the verse. They add the word, but. This is a big but, y'all. But the Lord. Can I just help you today? That whatever you're seeing in the natural, this is the moment you're waiting for. But God. But God. This is the diagnosis. But the Lord is in the temple. This is the reality of my marriage. But the Lord is in the temple. This is the state of my family. But the Lord is in the temple. Are you following me? First service got excited about this part, but I don't know. Maybe you're not excited. But God. But God, but the Lord is in the temple. It's like, I love the, in, in, in Habakkuk, it's woe, 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 but God is in the temple. But God is on the throne. David said it this way, Psalm 40, verse 1 and 2, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and he heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud, out of the mire. He set my feet on a rock, and he gave me a firm place to stand. All throughout the Bible, we see, we see, we see the men and women of God that are, that are forced to wait, and they're waiting, and, and then we see something like Habakkuk. We see something like David. Here's what Isaiah said. You've probably heard this in Isaiah chapter uh, 40. It says this. It says, even youth grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar like wings, uh, with wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. I have a favorite place to get away to. It's a magical place to me. It's in Southern Colorado, and there is a river filled with trout that runs through it. In the last couple of times I've visited this magical place, there's been a bald eagle that's been soaring overhead. And I love this and I hate it at the same time. I'll tell you why I hate it first. I hate it first because bald eagles are better fishermen than me. That's why I hate it. And I'm like, you are just trying to get my trout before me. And I, and I don't like that. And I just, I don't like that. Here's why I do like, here's what I do like is there's a moment, remember how he said that sometimes the Lord will speak to us through creation. One day, one day I pulled up, I got out of the truck, I looked up, I saw the bald eagle, and all of a sudden Isaiah 40 came alive to me. Because all of a sudden my heart remembers the word of God, right? That, that even those who hope, uh, another version says, wait. Those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. Can I, can I tell you, there's a reason that the Holy Spirit did not tell Isaiah to, to write the words, those who wait upon the Lord like a hummingbird will renew their strength. There's a reason. Have you ever seen a hummingbird? They don't soar, right? A hummingbird has ADHD times a hundred. They cannot sit still. I mean, just flapping and flapping. They, they flap when they eat. I think, I don't know this. I think they flap when they sleep. That's not true. They flap all the time. Are you following me? They're just working and working and working and working. That's not what the Holy Spirit said to Isaiah. He didn't say you're going to wait like a hummingbird. He said you're going to wait like an eagle. You're going to put those big wings out and you're just going to coast. You're going to catch those updrafts and you're just going to, you're just going to go and it's gonna look effortless, and you're just gonna you're just gonna soar, and in that your strength is renewed. S some versions, some versions say this as those who wait on the Lord. Here's the problem with that word and our and our English understanding, our American understanding, is we think of wait like this. I'm just gonna find a comfy place. I'm gonna I'm just gonna take a seat. I'm gonna put my feet up and I'm just gonna wait. And our version of that, when we hear that, is it's very passive, right? Like, I'm just, I'm just gonna wait. I'm just gonna lay here on the beach and I'm just gonna wait until God shows up and he does something. I'm just gonna wait, right? And that's not at all, that's not at all what this means. This word, wait, it has such a cool meaning. It means to intertwine. 
It's, it's not passive, but it's all, it all, it's actually very, very active. It, it's to intertwine. I'll, I'll show it to you. I'm going to help you. I brought, I brought some rope to help you. Here's what happens. Many of you in this room have made the decision to join your life with the life of Christ. That happens initially through salvation. You pray a prayer, you, you, you realize your sin, right? You confess your sin. It says he's faithful and just to forgive. You join your life with Christ through salvation. You give him your life, but here's what happens because this is a process, learning what it looks like to surrender to Christ. We love the idea of salvation, but we hate the idea of surrender. So we continue to live our life separate from Christ, even though we had a moment of salvation. Salvation and surrender are different. Surrender is a daily process. It says daily we take up our cross and follow him. So salvation happens. This is the waiting. It's the intertwining. It's the joining of my life with Christ's life. And you guys know this, you know the Bible teaches that a cord of multiple strands is not easily broken. A cord of multiple strands, it gets stronger as you join. Can I just tell you that part of the reason that Isaiah is teaching this idea is that if you're exhausted, you probably have not intertwined your life with the life of Christ. And you're probably trying to solve the problems on your own strength. I mean, you, you are hummingbirding it instead of eagling it. Is that making sense? You're working and you're working. And I'm not saying you don't love Jesus. You do love Jesus, but you are working and you're working and you're working. And Jesus is saying this, wait on me. Intertwine your life with me. My burden is easy. My burden is light. If you will join your life with me, I'll take care of it. Any of y'all remember? It's like a, I don't know, like an old like picnic family reunion type of game, the, the three-legged race. Anyone remember this? You, you tie two people's middle legs together and then they put their arms around each other and then they race, right? So Lisa and I, you know, our legs are different lengths. So it was, it was always hard for us because, because we had to figure out with our legs tied together how to stay in step with one another. Because my leg is shorter, she can't make hers longer, but I can shorten my stride. So I had to learn that if I wanted to, to win the three-legged race, I had to pay closer attention to the stride of Lisa, to the speed of Lisa. If, if Lisa paused, I needed to pause or we're tumbling over. If Lisa sped up, I needed to speed up. Are you following me? And this is the intertwining of our lives. The Lord's saying, tie yourself to me. And you won't be exhausted because when I pause, you pause. When I speed up, you speed up. And I will lead you out of the darkness. I will bring hope into the dark. Why don't you stand with me? I know that some of you have come today and you are in a dark season. It's just a metaphor. You're not in trouble. No one's mad at you. Life is full of dark seasons. We've had our fair share, it happens. The problem with darkness is a couple of things. It's consuming, it's lonely, it's overwhelming, it's hard to find hope. My assignment is to bring you hope in the dark place. Your assignment, by the way, as the church, is to bring hope into the dark places where you reside. You get to bring hope into the dark places where you live, where you work, where you play, the people you associate with, the, the things you're a part of. You get to bring the hope into those dark places. But today, I know there's some people that are here today and life has just been overwhelming. It's hard. You, you probably feel like Habakkuk in chapter one. God, I know that you're good and you're loving and you're kind, but this doesn't make sense. I don't know how you could allow this to happen. I don't, I don't understand it. And, and in chapter one, you're embracing and you're wrestling and you're embracing and you're wrestling. And now I'm asking you to wait. Though it linger, 
though the promise of God over your life, over your marriage, over your children, over your purpose, over your future, though it's lingering, though it's waiting, though it's hesitating, though you cannot see how it's going to happen. I want to go back to what God said to to Habakkuk in chapter one. He said, I'm getting ready to bless you so much so that if I told you, you couldn't imagine it. I believe that for you today. I believe that for your life. So I'm asking you to wait, to wait, to hold on, to intertwine your life with the life of Christ and to wait for the faithfulness of God because he's faithful. He's faithful. It's hard to see, but he's faithful. One of the things I love about being part of a local church is that we don't wait alone. We don't wait alone. One of the roles of my job as a pastor is that I'm often, I'm often with people in waiting rooms. And we already said this, waiting's no fun. So why in the world did hospitals create rooms for the thing that none of us like, right? The waiting. And often I'm in the waiting room and I learned a long time ago that I can't solve anything in the waiting room. I just go sit with my friend in the waiting room. So I learned a long time ago, often when I go to the waiting room, I try to show up with a, with a little something to bring a little joy into the waiting room. So I show up in the waiting room with Chick-fil-A chicken nugget trays, and I show up with stuffed animals, and I show up with balloons, and I show, are you following me? Like, I just wanna show up and say, hey, it's not over. I'll wait with you. And in the, in the waiting room today, here's the good news, you're not alone. So if you, Find yourself in a season where you're having to wait. This is my ask. Don't wait alone. Don't wait alone. Let us, let your church family come around you and wait with you. Waiting in anticipation of what God is going to do, of the miraculous power of God to show up in your life. So here's, here's what it's gonna look like. Worship team is about to help me with a, a final song. And as they sing this song, I don't care if you sing it or not, you really, it doesn't matter. This is our chance to respond to God and his word. But if you are in that place, I'm gonna ask you, this takes some courage, but would you step out from where you are and would you meet us down here at the front? Would you come as a, it's a signal, God, I'm waiting. I'm not gonna give up. I'm not gonna give up. Your promise is lingering, but I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna hold on. I'm not gonna give up. And here's what's gonna happen is God's gonna move on the hearts of some of your friends and some of our leaders. They're gonna come. They're gonna put their arm around you and they're basically saying, I'm waiting with you. I'm in the waiting room. You got this. We're gonna do it together and they're gonna pray over you. And by the way, I saw this in the first service. God's gonna use... Remember how he talks to us, to us? He talks to us through his spirit. That's gonna happen. Some of you are gonna hear a word of God and you're gonna need to write it down today. Some of you, someone's gonna come, they're gonna put their arm around you, they're gonna pray for you and God's gonna use someone else to speak prophetically into your life. You should write that down too. Today, God's gonna speak to you. He's gonna reveal himself to you. He's gonna, he's gonna show you his promise and then we're gonna wait in expectation. So if that's you, you can come as the worship team comes and leads us in a final song, let's wait on the Lord.